The MPTF Media Center presents the international premiere podcast of Mystery Theater Audibles, Black Fire, a science fiction fantasy novel written and narrated by Anthony Lawrence, directed and produced by Madeline Smith-Lawrence, produced by Jennifer Clymer, sound engineered by Marcus Murrieta. Chapter 35 Miguel couldn't believe his good luck. One minute he was in the San Fernando Valley, wandering down Van Nuys Boulevard in total darkness, freaking out. The next minute he was in a comfortable taxi and being taken all the way to Las Vegas, according to a complete stranger, as an all-expenses-paid guest of one of those fantastic resorts. Of course, he couldn't see that the resort wasn't exactly on the Strip, or that it was far more fantastic than he could imagine, and that it had an unusual authenticity and elegance of concept and design unknown in downtown Las Vegas. The cab driver had stopped for food and drinks along the way, assuring Miguel that the man who had ordered the cab had provided all the funds necessary for the long trip. But despite the fact that he couldn't see any of the magnificence of his surroundings, when Miguel was escorted inside the casino, He knew where he was because he could hear the chatter of many voices, the clicking and ringing of the slots and chips and many noises that, while he couldn't immediately recognize them, still assured him that he was in a place of great extravagance and excitement. There was an energy in the air that aroused and exhilarated him. The very presence of a young woman whom he couldn't see but whose voice was low and sultry stimulated him as she told him her name was Samanya, and explained the basics of why he was here. His name had been selected randomly as a jackpot winner of a two-week stay at the fabulous Blackfire Resort. She had gone on to show him to a suite, which he also could not see, but could feel its walls, could touch its furnishings, and assume that it was of a quality and beauty he had never known. He had managed to shower and change into some clothing that he had been provided for him ordered a magnificent meal from room service, and indulged on a scale that he could never have imagined in his wildest dreams. It was a dinner that must have been cooked by angels. It was a bottle of 50-year-old Scotch whiskey that had blown his mind and blurred his senses. He knew that he was in a heaven on earth and pushed away the thought that it would have to end after two weeks. For the first time since he was blinded in Afghanistan, Miguel was feeling glad that he was alive. His head was spinning from the scotch whiskey, from the smells and sounds and touch of a world that he really didn't know existed, or if he did, could never have conceived that he might one day be experiencing a part of it. Then the unbelievable took on the mantle of something more like a dubious miracle. Just like many others faced with the contemplation of an actual dream coming true, he was skeptical and uncertain. Miguel had grown up in a barrio, an urban village, a modern descendant of Aztecs. He remembered the signs on the walls of the barrios in his childhood. Viva Kennedy and Abajo Dodgers and Ropa Yosada, as well as the gang Graffiti. Miguel lived a childhood and became streetwise, where the cockroaches grew healthy and strong, and exterminating them was the main sport of the barrio hunters. He had gone through hell in Afghanistan, and he was hardly quite ready to accept the concept that by simply winning a miraculous wager in a single game of Texas Hold'em, he could regain his sight. Samanya had brought Miguel to table 18 just as she had done with many others, and he had listened to Daniel's explanation about the experiential betting and how he could win back his sight by wagering something of equal value. And just like with most others, It sounded like bullshit, especially when Daniel suggested to Miguel that an equal wager under the circumstances might consist of offering up his sister Maria's child. At first, Miguel had reacted with typical stunned disbelief and confusion. His brain was still on fire from the scotch whiskey he had consumed both in his room and at a bar where he had waited for Samanya. Maybe he hadn't heard right. None of what Daniel was saying made any sense. But the unseen man who Miguel could hear talking kept right on insisting that what he was suggesting was authentic. 
wager his sister's child, Manolito? What the fuck was this asshole talking about? Why would they want a child? What would they do with him? It was crazy. Daniel, of course, anticipated, as always, the resistance to his suggestions. He quickly reassured Miguel that no harm would come to the child if the bet was lost. The wagers here were simply metaphorical and symbolic exercises that had a great deal to do with human psychology and were to illustrate the power of the human mind and spirit. Miguel's expression told Daniel that he was totally baffled by the explanation. Daniel, as usual, was undaunted, went on to point out that if a person truly was convinced that he could accomplish something by strongly believing it could happen, and that even neuroscientists were coming to the realization that this powerful belief in the human brain could actually cause a positive or negative result. The cards were just a tool to use to illustrate the power of the mind. It was just like praying. Real belief could make things happen. Daniel knew that Miguel had been raised a Catholic and had known from his beliefs and from things he had seen around him of the power of prayer. Daniel seemed to know all about Miguel's father, Arturo, who had owned a religious store in the barrio and was known as a curandero, a healer. As a child, Miguel had played in the store with the Arculos, religiosos, and herbas. He had lit candles to the infant of Prague and to Christ and to a huge, ominous Indian chief in blood-red wax. Daniel knew all of that and knew of the people Miguel's father had healed with the power of the herbs and his simple prayers. Perhaps it was the same power in Daniel's words and beliefs that began to convince Miguel or perhaps it was just the scotch and his intense desire to see again. But when Daniel told Miguel that just going along with the game and betting would give him an extra two weeks in this paradise, Miguel could no longer resist. After all, as others before him had rationalized, what did they have to lose? He didn't really believe that he would regain his sight if he won, and he didn't really believe they were any kind of threat to Maria's baby. So what difference did it make if he went along with their little game? Once the rules were set in place and approved by Daniel, the game began. It was quick and ended in Miguel's favor. He had two pair, kings and nines, winning over Daniel's pair of aces. Miguel couldn't actually see the results, but when told by Daniel that he had won, he was exultant. He wasn't celebrating the fact that he might win seeing everything he had been missing, which was his wager, but rather the fact that he got to stay in the resort for two weeks longer. He didn't have a clue regarding the horrific and bizarre nature of what his win was really going to mean. Oh, Miguel would see again, but it wasn't going to make him even the least bit happy. Chapter 36 The VIPs were arriving. In the dark of night, some came down in black helicopters that swooped onto the landing docks like great birds of prey. Others were brought in long black stretch Hummer limousines, and still others arrived in enormous black tour buses, like the kind in which rock stars traveled. No one was ever allowed to actually see the VIPs, and as usual, under cover of the pitch-black night, they were hustled into the underground garages of the various hotels. Because they neither needed nor wanted any services of the kind required by normal guests, the staff of the hotel was uninformed and unaware of both their arrival and presence. The VIPs didn't stay in hotel suites like other guests, their quarters were subterranean. Chapter 37 She woke slowly, light and sound intruding on the dark piece of sleep. Why had she been sleeping in broad daylight, she thought. 
Then the memories came streaming into her mind like a film being played backward. She had been sobbing, struggling to get away from Samania. Rafe had come into the room, and she had allowed herself to be pawed at by the seductive concierge whose arms had been around her instead of security men in some terminal purgatory. Was it all just a nightmare? Part of some greater nightmare that she had been having ever since Cody had died? Jordan sat up on the large sofa and listened to the sound of the door buzzer as it came again. Certainly that was real. She looked around her at the expansive and elegant suite, and it all came back suddenly. It was real. She could feel the soft velvet of the sofa. She could feel her own arm. Slowly, she rose to her feet and moved to the large doors of the suite. She opened the door warily and peered out into the corridor. He was standing, smiling at her. The man was dressed completely in black, with just a touch of white that was his clerical color. The gaunt and pale young face and figure appeared curiously out of place, benign and non-threatening. Jordan didn't recognize him or have any knowledge that despite his youthful appearance, this seemingly unassuming priest had been and still was the object of Rafe's hatred from the time he was a little boy but she still held the door firmly, only half open, because she didn't trust anyone in this madhouse, not even a Catholic priest. But still there was something familiar about his look and way of speaking that took her back to her own childhood when she had lived with her mother and grandmother in a small town in Georgia. Her father had left them after a night of abuse, swearing to come back and take Jordan away from the influence of her grandmother, whom he considered a religious zealot. He hated Georgia. It was a region that was part of the Christ-haunted Bible Belt of the southern states. This young man was dressed as a priest, but he reminded Jordan strongly of a Protestant minister who had courted her grandmother. The only things missing were the blue suit and the stern black preacher's hat. Jordan Carroll, he asked politely. She nodded slowly and his smile brightened. I'm Father Matus. May I speak with you for a moment? I'm sorry, she said softly, unable to disguise her wariness and distrust. I understand, he replied with a smile meant to comfort those under great stress. But I think I might be of some help to you. I know we have many things in common. I doubt that. What's a priest doing here, anyway? <laughs> Wouldn't you say this is a place in great need of someone like me? I'm a Jesuit, by the way. <laughs> Not exactly a great recommendation. I assure you, Jordan, I mean you no harm. Jordan regarded him carefully, still unwilling to give way. So what else do we have in common besides being Catholic? Ah, yes. Perhaps... A love of Dickinson. Afraid? Of whom am I afraid? Not death. Or who is he? <laughs> yeah, you've been talking to the concierge, maybe the researchers. They're pretty thorough. Yes, they are, Jordan. But they wouldn't know that Flannery O'Connor was one of your grandmother's best friends in Milledgeville. Jordan was stunned. That fact was not common knowledge. Even the great Southern short story writer had rarely given out that information. Flannery O'Connor and Jordan's grandmother, Therese, had attended Peabody High School in Milledgeville, and both had gone on to Georgia State College for women. They had bonded early, but the friendship deteriorated in direct proportion to Therese's growing religious evangelism. O'Connor was a devout believer whose growing body of fiction presented the soul's struggle with what she called the stinking mad shadow of Jesus and was simply unable to accept her friend's fervent conviction that Therese was a prophet and a healer. When Jordan's mother died of pneumonia soon after the birth of her only child, Therese had taken over the raising and caring of the baby. The death of Jordan's mother was thought to be an epiphany that drove her own mother from Catholicism and towards spiritual healing, 
and to keep Jordan away from her drunken father. Jordan grew to adore her vivid and tempestuous Irish grandmother, who shared love of the child with her commitment to her faith. Sister Teresa O'Brien attracted a large following with her lively meetings, which often included speaking in tongues, as well as faith healing. She had a magnetic personality and had begun a meteoric rise in the itinerant Pentecostal ministries. But when Jordan was still quite young, her grandmother had mysteriously disappeared, never to be seen again. Police at the time investigated hundreds of leads, but no trace of her was ever found. Jordan slowly opened the door and allowed the still-smiling Father Matus to enter her suite. Despite his apparent knowledge of intimate details of her life, Jordan still wasn't quite yet sure she could trust him, but she was desperate for someone to trust. So far, everyone she had met in this strange place, with the exception of Rafe, who like herself was only a guest, had turned out to be a source of betrayal. This soft-spoken priest seemed to be a gentle and highly educated man with ties to a time in her early childhood that were painful and still a great, unfilled well of curiosity and confusion. He was too young to have known her grandmother personally, but she wanted to know more about what he knew and how he knew it. She also was acutely aware that if she were going to get out of this place, she was going to need help to do it. How did you get here? What's going on here? Who the hell is Daniel Carinthus? How did you know about my grandmother? Questions rattled on as Jordan backed slowly away from the priest and he shut the door gently behind him. Slow down now, Jordan, he replied easily, his hands coming up in a calming gesture. Let's take one question at a time. How did I get here? I was invited just as you were. Why? Why are people invited? I mean, what is this place? I, I was a dealer in Vegas. I never heard of this place. Then I get this crazy invitation, and nothing after that seemed to make any sense. Well, Jordan, there are questions that can't easily be answered, but this, this resort is much like Las Vegas. I certainly would agree with you that it is strange and often bizarre. But like Las Vegas, it seems to address the universal need for dream and wish fulfillment for some, while at the same time causing disappointment and heartache for others. <laughs> but the things that have been happening to me, they're not real, they can't be, they've, they've been just like nightmares. Father Matus sat down in a large chair and sighed heavily. Yes, I know, the same kinds of things have been happening to me. I came here because I had lost my faith and wanted to recover it. At first, I, I didn't believe it could be possible in a place like this. It seemed this was worse than the chaos my life had become. But something wonderful happened. And what had been chaotic became an entirely new world of ordered, tractable reality. It was all really something Flannery O'Connor once said to me. Faith is what someone knows to be true, whether they believe it or not. Flannery O'Connor, but, but she must have died before you were born. Oh, yes, he quickly corrected himself. I, I really was referring to my father, who knew her quite well. In fact, he told me that she had based a character she had written in a novel on him. It was a novel called Wise Blood, about a man named Hazel Moat returned from the army with his faith gone awry. My father was quite a remarkable man who tried to establish a church without Christ. He wore a preacher's bright blue suit and a preacher's black hat. Jordan reacted, recalling that man her grandmother had told her about. I think my grandmother knew him. Didn't he drive an old Essex automobile? Yes, that's right. I'm afraid that O'Connor took that fact to an extreme. She wrote in her novel that Hazel Moat murdered a false prophet, his rival, by running over him with that second-hand Essex. My father could never have gone quite that far, even though his life was all about sin and redemption. O'Connor's novel combined the comic with the tragic and brutal. Although she thought the good was under construction, she belonged to the Southern Gothic tradition that focused on the decaying South and its damned people but it was really about the fall of all humanity and its need for redemption. It was also about my own 
personal search for God and the quest for the holy in my life. Jordan studied the man's face for a long moment as he lapsed into a pensive silence, and then she formed a conclusion. You won at table 18. That's right, Jordan. I recovered my faith almost instantly, just like your friend Rafe recovered his memory. Rafe, you know him? Yes, yes, I know him quite well. He's doing fine now, in case you were wondering. Jordan had been wondering, but she could tell that Rafe had gotten his memory back when he appeared in her hotel suite at just the moment she was fending off the concierge. She knew from his expression that he had his memory back. What she was wondering was what he thought about her after seeing her in Samanya's embrace. But let's talk about you, Jordan. I lost at table 18, she pointed out darkly. Yes, I said, I know. But you do have another chance. To do what? She asked rhetorically, knowing that he probably knew the answer to that as well. She was right. To bring your son back. Just hearing it caused a chill to pervade Jordan's body. Was Father Matus trying to toy with her fracturing emotions just like Daniel? Jordan tried to remain calm, unemotional, but her words betrayed her feelings. Father, can you imagine what it's like to create life and then watch it get ripped away from you? All I want is to bring Cody back and then my life can be perfect again. I could even live with my death if it meant he got another chance, but there's just a... Yes, 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 there is, Father Mantu said gently. Wager one more time, Jordan. If you win, you'll get your son back. Jordan's question struggled to get out. Do you really believe that is possible? I not only believe it, I know it. I've seen it happen. Chapter 38 I, I couldn't believe it. Daniel wanted me to actually kill somebody who had come to the resort without an invitation. I straight out told him what I thought about that idea. I said he was fucking crazy and I wasn't about to kill anybody. He just smiled at me and said something about the quantum dynamics of free will. At first I thought, give me a break. What the hell are you talking about? But then somehow I began to understand what he was saying. And while I, I really wanted to just get the hell away from that hovering holographic image, I listened to Daniel's words and was able to process the theoretic concept he was offering. It had to do with holonomic brain theory and the exercise of free will. Okay, okay, so all that doesn't mean shit to you. So let me put it this way. It has to do with freedom of choice. You see, we've, we've got all these constraints that we have to get rid of so we can have more choices about what we think and what we do. I understood what he was talking about, but it didn't make me any more willing to kill some stranger who wandered inside past their security. Maybe he could make me stay here fucking forever, like he said, but I wasn't going to kill for him. Then I found myself wandering outside the main casino as night fell across the roof of this still incomprehensible place. I was supposed to be looking for some unknown interloper who was uninvited, but I wasn't sure just who that might be. Daniel had said I would know when I saw the person. I wanted to ask the obvious question, like, just how was I supposed to know? But I never got the questions out. Daniel's holographic image had melted away, and I was left alone with a question still unanswered. Would this unnamed person Daniel even fail to describe be furtively running around looking for some place to hide? You know, there were hundreds, maybe thousands of people who apparently were legitimate invited guests. How the fuck was I supposed to know where or who this gate crasher was? I didn't know why I was even going along with any of this in the first place, but I, I figured it was just another in a growing list of crazy events in this crazy madhouse. Talk about free will. What I really wanted to do was find Jordan. 
but something appeared to be guiding my steps toward these massive French doors leading out of the building, first onto a massive terrace just outside the casino, and then down along a winding pathway that led through arbors of flowers and cascading waterfalls. And then came the fog. It drifted out of the night, wrapped itself around me, obscuring the pathway and the landscape ahead. I could hardly make out a thing in front of me, but I could feel the smooth tile walkway under my shoes. A silent gloom had surrounded me, and I hesitated to even take a step, but I slowly inched my way along, wondering if I should turn back. I'd never seen fog this thick even in San Francisco. It had swept in so suddenly, and here in the middle of the desert. Where the hell did a fog like this come from? This was dry fucking Nevada desert. Like everything else that had been happening to me, it didn't make any sense. But there was something else that grew even stranger, the feel of it and the smell. It seemed more like one of London's notorious pea supers. And I could definitely smell something that was not at all like modern-day London, but rather more like coal smoke saturated fog, thicker and more persistent than natural fog. I grew up reading and loving Dickens, almost obsessively identifying with all those young homeless boys he wrote so extensively about. Oliver Twist, Pip, Nicholas Nickleby, and David Copperfield. Like my own childhood, as well as Dickens' own, they had all grown up in squalid environments, abused and abandoned. Somehow this dense mist that had enveloped me so suddenly made me think of Dickens' 19th century London, where residents burned soft coal which made their winter fogs more than a nuisance and now appeared to be the very same filthy vapor drifting to my nose. I reached out in front of me, trying to connect with anything substantial. My fingertips touched something hard, which seemed to be some kind of stone archway. It was then that the sounds drifted to my ears like some hollow, distant echo of a time long gone by. The rattling clatter of horse-drawn vehicles like street sweepers and vendors hawking their wares. A cacophony of street noises like the soundtrack from a movie about Oliver Twist. I still couldn't see the source of its noises, but then as I walked a little further, I became aware of light coming from a feeble street gas lamp. A gas lamp? Then I became aware that the smooth tile of the pathway had become what felt like the irregular stones of a cobbled street. Ahead of me, I began to see the outlines of crooked buildings and a dirty, wretched street, narrow and muddy. Okay, okay, I thought. Take it easy. So you've stumbled into a Dickens theme park, like the one they have in Chatham, England. Kitschy, but faithful. It could be a part of the Blackfire Resort that I simply hadn't known about. Believe me, nothing about this fucking resort would have surprised me too much by now. It looked real enough, and I fully expected to be seeing the ghost of Christmas past in Ebenezer Scrooge's haunted house, be hectored by a schoolmaster at Dothby's Hall, the dismal school from Nicholas Nickleby, and maybe even peer into the fetid cells of Nougat Prison. But then, more than likely, this is where that gate-crashing character must be running around loose. I figured I probably would be seeing him before I saw Oliver Twist. I couldn't deny, however, the overwhelming feelings of reality about what I was experiencing. Even the air seemed to be impregnated with filthy street odors along with the coal smoke. I could see a good many small shops, and I imagined from the sounds I was hearing that even at this time of night, there were heaps of children crawling out of the doors and screaming from the inside. I said imagined, because the truth is, I could see nothing but the general blight of the place, the despicable public houses, the covered ways and yards, which here and there diverged from the dark main street. Even though I could plainly hear the street noises of 19th century London, 
the struggling workers, aspiring clerks, orphans, rogues, peddlers, and thieves. I could see no one, not one soul. The night streets might have been inhabited by ghosts of times past for all I could see. It was just another dream. My logical mind had to make sense of it, to classify it, to identify it. But if it were a dream, it was definitely a lucid dream because I was aware that I must have been dreaming. I was aware, as in the previous dreams, wait a minute, were those other bizarre experiences just dreams? What about trying to shoot the priest and being unable? What about losing my memory? What about the poker betting, the attempt to escape with Jordan, the erupting earth, the cactus, and Cody? Were these all just dreams? More like nightmares. What the fuck was happening when I seemed to understand all that pseudoscience crap that Daniel was handing out? Maybe it really did all come down to madness. Maybe I was really just a textbook case for schizophrenia. But the biggest question of all was why I was feeling the way that I did. It was understandable that I was fearful, just the very nature of suddenly finding myself in this bizarre reenactment of Dickens' sickly, dirt-stained, wretched, damned world where rat catchers hunt vermin on London's cobbled streets, where pickpockets roam the alleys, was enough to elicit plenty of fear and alarm. But why was I feeling the overwhelming and pervasive loneliness and sense of abandonment? Why was this place lighting me up and making me return to the feelings of my own childhood? I couldn't shake the sudden despair and panic that was making my whole body tremble. There was something about this place that made me feel I belonged here, that somehow I was really Oliver Twist, that accidental pilgrim, here again as a passive bystander in a battle for my soul. I felt at the lowest ebb of lonesomeness and desolation. I was just a vulnerable child who had met and will again meet a corrupter with a smiling face. Just like Oliver and Dickens himself, I had suffered in secret, suffered exquisitely. No one ever knew how much I had suffered. It was beyond my power to tell. Yes, I was like Oliver, but I was as much the artful dodger, another street urchin who had the manners and airs of a man, bow legs and little sharp ugly eyes, and was, as Blake said of Milton, of the devil's party without knowing it. I blinked through the undulating fog, penetrated only by faint auras of light from street gas lamps. I cringed at the sound of some foul choir of voices like demons in the bowels of hell, torturing their victims. But it was only the cries of hawkers, shouts, oaths, and screams of unseen thieves, drunks, beggars, and prostitutes quarreling on all sides, the ringing of bells and roar of street voices. I was able to see down the intricate maze of streets and narrow courts the shadowy and surreal impressions of Oliver's life, long and stick-like shadows that formed grotesque imitations of Dickens' menagerie of characters. I saw the obese shadow of the beetle, Mr. Bumble, with his long frock coat stretched over his giant belly and cocked hat, then what appeared to be a coffin carried along the street on the shoulders of dark bearers, with a small boy's shadow at the lead, with black stick and hat band, flat wool, muffin cap, and leathers. And as the wild screeching continued, the procession of shadows creeped and stretched beneath low archways up dirty courts and along the buckled building walls. I saw the shadow of the very old shriveled Fagin, whose villainous-looking and repulsive face was obscured, but I knew him just the same. His shadow was closely followed by another that I knew could only be the wicked Bill Sykes with his black velveteen coat, brown hat, and dirty belcher handkerchief around his neck. But the shadow of Bill Sykes did not continue its rippling movement after that of Fagin's. It seemed to dip and turn directly toward me. And out of the dark pit of an alleyway arose the figure of a man, 
not a shadow anymore, but a real man. I froze. I couldn't believe it. I was stunned as I stared at the face of the man and saw that it definitely was not that of Bill Sykes. Chapter 39 He could walk on water. It wasn't because he was Jesus, or even because he was like the simple-minded character of chance from Jerzy Kaczynski's novella, Being There. It was because Daniel understood the qualities and properties of water. His intellectual mind understood its scientific principles, and his metaphysical mind understood its spiritual nature. Daniel knew our thinking apparatus runs on water, that our physical bodies are two-thirds water, and that memory, imagination, and reason are in water-filled cavities of the brain. He also knew that water could transfer to us the life force energy chi, also called prana down through the ages. Daniel knew that water was central to sacred rituals and symbols, baptism, the holy river, spiritual visions of the ocean of love, myths of the flood and of creation itself, drinking of sacred waters when visiting an oracle or a shrine. Daniel knew that water was a living rhythmic substance and that its cells have a unique structure and clusters of its molecules have organized relationships capable of storing and transmitting information. He knew there was an interaction between water and consciousness. It was a liquid memory system that, like blood cells, expressed themselves in sacred geometry, and that it was part of the unseen intelligence of the universe, the spark of spirit in the cells that gives rise to life forces even beyond that of humanity. Daniel walked slowly and evenly across the surface of the azure water in the sacred pond. He was barefooted and wore a simple vestment with open wide and bell-shaped sleeves. The Geneva gown was scarlet red and worn vented over a cassock with preaching bands and an academic hood. From his costume, despite its untraditional color, he might have been any young priest on his way to Mass, but the ritual he was about to perform was anything but a typical Christian vesting prayer. The sacred pond was a large Olympic-sized oval-shaped pool at the center of a domed edifice that was completely adorned with tesserae, small cubes of mosaic tile. The shrine ceiling, walls, floors, and the entire surfaces of the underwater curvature of the sacred pond were made up of small cubes of marble and other stones that provided a range of vivid colors and reflected light. They consisted of exquisite geometric and mathematical Byzantine designs, as well as decorative art of cultural and metaphysical significance. But the artwork was quite different in motif from the Roman bathhouses or Christian basilicas. Although some were recognizable like the Feast of Bacchus, symbolizing transformation and change, these darker mosaic images were not bright and colorful naturalism that adhered to the classical canons of order and proportion. This was grand scale and superlative craftsmanship, but it was overwhelming in its dark imagery of the melancholy side of religion and the raw, sexual, and fantastic aspects of life to a blasphemous degree. There was a terrifying depiction of the four horsemen of the apocalypse that John of Patmos recorded in the Book of Revelation, and numerous bizarre, morbid, and horrifying scenes that might have been painted by the Netherlandish artist Hieronymus Bosch. The nudes, orgies, phallic symbols, Religious betrayals were very similar to the stunning and amazingly detailed phantasmagoria of Bosch's Garden of Earthly Delights. But the monsters, gorgons, and frightening creatures depicted in the intricate mosaics might have come from the mind of the more contemporary master, H.R. Giger, who created the film horror in 
alien. Daniel's gliding footsteps over the serene surface of the water brought him to the far edge where a waterfall cascaded beside a ciborium, a canopy covering supported by columns that was freestanding over a large bronze altar. It was similar to the bronze altar in the Old Testament in that it was actually made of wood overlaid with bronze and containing a grating at the top. Next to the altar were a flaming torch, utensils, incantation bowls of honey, butter, cedar, and cypress, along with bronze pots and shovels to remove the ashes of sacrifices. Stepping onto a treasure-eye adorned shelf near the surface of the pool, Daniel looked upward and raised his hands toward the ceiling. His incantation was soft but audible. Mis pipit pitipus. It was part of the Mesopotamian Miss P mouthwashing rite of transition going back to the third millennium BCE. In order to create the induction of a deity's cult statue for whatever purpose, it was necessary to open its mouth. A statue that has not had its mouth opened does not smell incense, does not eat food, and does not drink water. Daniel lifted each bowl and tasted the honey butter, cedar, and cypress, then cleansed his mouth from the holy water basin. Miss P. Pitidapas, and Alam Kikugalala Gogonata. Daniel slowly continued the incantation as his hands grasped one of the bowls that was shaped like a colander with myriad holes at its base. His body began to tremble, his torso twisting and his mouth opening wider and wider like a python engaging and encompassing its prey, his lower jaw seeming to disengage. His mouth yawned and gaped as his body convulsed. He managed to hold the colander under his mouth that was now disarranged and elongated like a black pit in the lower half of his face. Then his entire body began a rapid series of convulsions and retching sounds mixed with the incantations intoned horribly from somewhere deep inside of him. Then there was one last gigantic and violent undulation. Daniel vomited the black fire opal into the waiting colander. There was little fluid that accompanied the rainbow flash of color emitted from the stone as it dropped into the colander. He had neither eaten nor drank for many days, and when he vomited, it was only the stone that was ejected. It made the smallest clicking noise as it hit the metal of the bowl, but as it lay there for a moment, it shone with an incandescence that was remarkable and spoke strongly of its inner life. Daniel recovered quickly from the retching convulsions, and his mouth and jaw reformed to the normal dimensions of his face. He continued the chanting incantation as he deftly picked the exquisite opal from the colander and raised it high over his head. Its striking brilliance was like the dark egg of a phoenix bird that radiated fire and immortality. Daniel threw it out into the middle of the sacred pool, and its movement appeared slower than normal, gliding as if on currents of air, glistening with more flashes of fire until it dipped and slid into the placid water. Daniel continued the incantation as he watched the surface of the pool. The surface was still for a long moment, then something began to happen within the dark and deep body of water. There was a slow swirling motion, a cycloid centrifugal outward moving motion, pushing, radiating. Something under the water was rising to the surface. <laughs>